Okay, it's 10 on 4. Let's call the meeting to order. Um, uh, is there any public comment? Yes. that? Oh, a recognition of honorable years of public service. Um, and that's true of everybody on this list except me. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, that's myself, Don, Charlie, Brent, Dean, Chris, and Josh are all uh, leaving after this uh, year. I might uh, add one quick note in this. I'm gonna stay on until the election day so that there is uh, continuity in, in this, but obviously as of election day, I'm resigning, but I would like to bring up right now uh, the uh, nomination or, or the formation of a nominating committee to uh, uh, choose somebody after November 7th when we have the, after the elections. Uh, and that would be uh, Dan, Tom, and Mike Chris, who's probably on the legislative meeting, I guess, or maybe he's oh, here. here on the okay, I, ah, I see it. Uh, so, could I have a motion to that effect? A move. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And uh, so that is uh, done. Uh, and my staying is only pro forma so that I can sign checks and do all that stuff during the, during the next two weeks. But, uh, I just want to express my appreciation to everybody for letting me chair this board. It's been really fun. And I appreciate everybody's service and uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, the one thing I'll add is that uh, typically, I guess, we have a going away present for those who are leaving the board. Uh, I believe it's a mug. It says, Life is Great, Van H. Cog or something similar to that. Uh, we They are on order, it's just not here yet. So if uh, for whatever reason, shocking darn, we, that was really we will be sure to get those two. <laughs> we will be sure to get those two. Oh, well, it's better to say like normally. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. Before we move on, I would just like to say that I appreciate everybody's services. And I, not that I like to choose favors or not, but my neighbor the community that Eight terms is amazing, Ron. Did a lot of great things for your community. My pleasure working with you. I appreciate it. It's nothing but the best. Thank you. And uh, everybody contributed here, but 16 years is amazing. You're not far behind, are you? Well, not that far behind. But still, it seems like every time it just, yeah. it just gets harder and harder for the state interaction, the amount of paper that goes through the office and everything, even in a small house. Uh, I will be around this amazing statewide. So that many people that achieve that. I thought I'd do one or two terms and then actually retire. I never envisioned doing this for 16 years, but it's been fun and it's been challenging. And I do appreciate the support of the COG and everybody else in the room and everybody's predecessor because I saw a lot of people coming and going. But I do appreciate it, Dan. Thank you. Uh, so we, should, well, we should probably create the time time for Segurance Award. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, 
Because I'm going to be spending a lot of time in France from now on. Should we conduct the rest of the meeting in French? Or is there any stretch? Okay, it's up to you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you all for those who are uh, outgoing for your, your service. Uh, obviously, it's been very beneficial for me uh, uh, with the transition that NHK has been under. So, I uh, really appreciate that. Um, as far as the uh, report of the executive director, what I did, uh, what I want, I've been thinking about doing this for quite a while, but I finally got around to doing it. Uh, I've created a, a kind of a memorandum uh, activity log that I sent out uh, late last night. Uh, so, you have it in your inbox if you haven't seen it yet. But, um, you know, essentially, it's just some activities of, of meetings and conversations of, uh, on topics that are listed in the report. So it's something you can kind of take home with you uh, and, and reference if you have any questions on anything that comes up in between meetings. Obviously, you can just contact me by email, phone, whatever, whatever uh, way it is more uh, convenient for you. So uh, I won't get into the details of that because I want to make sure we have time for everybody to have conversations, uh, you know, roundtable and whatever else uh, comes from that. So. Uh, but again, any questions on that yeah, after the meeting, during the meeting, and at any, any point in time, just let me know. Um, regional service grant and the report is attached uh, with the agenda. It's basically something we put together every year as a response to our regional service grant to formulate funding from OPM. Uh, it's traditionally been shared with the commission or the committee, so I've, I've done that here as well. Household Hazardous Waste Collection Day, again, a reminder, it's October 28th, a little later this year. Uh, that's coming up soon. I believe everything is out on that. Um, if you have any questions or issues, uh, we'll be sure to make sure that the uh, circulation there is better than last fall. Um, it was, uh, it turned out to be a little bit uh, uh, tough, uh, at least a couple of times where there was a line out to the road and some people were waiting up to an hour. That's not uh, the outcome that we want. So we're gonna make sure that we have that uh, in a better situation this time. Uh, potential, Wanted to have a discussion on potential November NH board NH COG board meeting. Either, you know, as you know, it falls about two days after the election. The question is whether that's a little too soon uh, with new members joining on, whether they're gonna, even going to be uh, available. You know, so we have a forum, uh, or should we, you know, look at potentially uh, having a special meeting if need be, or just canceling it out altogether? It's something I'll or to decide. Uh, if you want to talk about that right now before I get to the legislative committee, that's fine. Uh, so the, a lot of new members want to take office to get to these things. Right. Is that, right. as, as I understand, it's all over the map. I mean, yeah, and you're done at eight yeah. o'clock yeah. the day of the election. Uh, no, it's, I'm not done until they finish counting the no. oh, ballots. So I'll probably be 8 05. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be through in a second for a minute. First. Oh, oh you're. <laughs> and you're on until January, right? Well, January first. So Since the uh, new guy has no opposition. I'm going to bring the needs to be available. We know who's, who's going to be. So clearly, if there's no issue with having a meeting two days after the election, we can hold it. It's the easiest path forward, but I, I, I wanted to at least bring up the points of discussion. Well, I, would, I would think you'd want to wait for the December meeting so that everything settles down and you get a full rule of new people who have actually taken office and have at least a sense of where their office and desk are. May I have any pressed the business that you think we may have to take care of? November. I don't see any. Especially. Yeah, all of us are still seated, depending you know, on the election anyway. Yeah, so. I mean, we have our uh, annual uh, meeting dates for the next year. We need to have approval. We can do that in the first meeting in December. Um, all the grants, I, I think, are in, in order, so I don't, I don't see anything. We don't see anything. So, this board is considering moving that November meeting and Henry who signs the check is out five minutes after eight. Who's gonna sign checks after that if we don't have a meeting until the seven? Tom Mike sign check? Yeah Tom I'm the secretary he's also authorized. So sorry treasurer. So he's already empowered mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. 
Are you willing to do that? I think the I think the reality is uh, that there'll be a, a vacancy with the chair. Right. Not a, uh, actually a, a, a Mike Crystal, I think not a vice chair and then secretary, right? When when Charlie when he, well, So Mike can take over as uh, as chair. Right. So he's a vice chair. Yeah, there's transition. Yeah, yeah there's there, there'll be a transition. So uh, so can I have a, um, a motion to cancel the uh, November meeting? All right. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Okay. Are there any objections, any abstentions? If, if something comes up that we need action, I'll, we'll have a discussion. But okay. All right, you want to go on to the legislative? All right, so, uh, yeah, I wanted to kind of get this on the agenda for discussion purposes ahead of time. Uh, we have we have a short session in the spring. Mike, Chris, obviously knows this very well, but I, I want to, typically, I think the, the, the committee has been formed as late as December, um, and it may be beneficial to kind of have that conversation at the committee in place before before we get to the December date. So uh, I just wanted to kind of throw it out there, and I didn't know, Mike, Chris, if you wanted to... Uh, uh, discuss any of this, but uh, it, it just might be beneficial to have things in place ahead of time because there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, discussions and planning and game planning that happens before the session even opens. So I don't know if it's, it would be beneficial to have uh, have that entity in place ahead of time. And Mike, do you, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I would agree. Having more a little more time with the committee and a few meetings scheduled in between would be good, especially during a short session. There's going to be a lot to cover. There's already uh, drafts of things being formed, and I have a list going, so it'd probably be good to get started earlier than later. Yeah, and I think we typically have a, a legislative breakfast in December, and uh, to get that plan in place, we kind of need to be ahead of the game. Mike, I'm surprised that you have a folder already <laughs> ready. <laughs> I know it's shocking, isn't it? <laughs> shocking to me. Are, are there any... Uh, members of the legislative committee that are not seeking re-election or any vacancy there. Um, yeah, Mike, uh, what do we have? I have to look that up. We have a lot of um, um, <laughs> We could start with, if, if people are interested, we could start with the same legislative committee you have in the spring. The last until the beginning. So why don't we just let the existing committee roll? Mike, Mike, you agree? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Okay. We need a motion on that, or? Uh, I don't think we need a motion on that. I think that we can just uh, do it by consensus, unless somebody wants to object. All right. I'll look at trying to organize a uh, kickoff meeting. Uh, do this in the future. Uh, when do you want to handle the uh, the uh, memorandum of, of understanding? Do you want to handle that during? Yeah, that's at the end. Uh, okay. All right. Unless you, unless you want to address it now, if there's any questions on that, but it's typically just a, a routine operation uh, for each demonstrant every year. Okay. Because that came early this morning. It's or uh, late last night, it's a uh, memorandum of understanding between the Western Council of Governments and the Northwest Council of Governments about region uh, by uh, financing. We do it every every year, so it's nothing extraordinary. So let's leave it until we uh, Anything more? Uh, that's all I have. Unless anybody has any questions. Um, is that your kitchen here? Oh, what? Jean has a oh, Jean has a question. Thanks for that. Okay, Jean. Good morning. Um, Rob, I just wanted to dovetail on the legislative committee. Um, there's a number of people here on the COG who are part of a um, cabinet subcommittee for Comptroller Scanlon. And we're, um, it's a rural health subcommittee to look at um, and propose in a report in December, January timeframe, 
um, a number of recommendations for policy legislative um, proposals. And I think that would, um, there's an advantage there, I think, to having a bunch of folks here on the COG on that committee. And I just wanted to make sure that you all knew that. And um, we'd love to, you know, keep you all apprised on the progress as we move and head into our recommendations and reports so that the COG can also, um, you know, at least consider some of what we're um, recommending. Any other comments? So, keep everyone. Well, since since you're already here, we're going to do a little switcheroo here. Okay? Oh, we're going to put you up before uh, Dr. Kitching because he's going to be a few minutes late. Sure, no problem. Thank you. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, I know it's been a while since you've heard from me, so that's probably a good thing for some of you. Uh, but uh, so quick updates. Uh, first, uh, just quickly about the regional opioid response fund. Um, we do have 11 participating towns. Um, so thank you to those of you who have uh, joined the fund um, this year with uh, with the uh, FY23 allocation that the 11 towns received. We had about fifty thousand uh, dollars. Still waiting on an allocation from Washington. Um, but a majority of that money will be going towards harm reduction supplies that will be the, uh, purchased by the Richfield County Opiate Task Force. So that will kind of be general support for the region as a whole. Um, and then about 20,000 will go towards uh, uh, creating these leave behind kits for our local EMS. So that when they respond to an overdose situation, they can actually leave something with that patient that will not only help them to avoid overdose in the future, but will also have some uh, material resources for uh, uh, treatment. Um, so we'll be partnering uh, first with Goshen, Warren, and uh, Kent. Uh, Goshen is not participating in the regional good response fund at this point, but um, because they receive so little funding, we feel it's our due diligence just as, a, as we do have this big pot of money to include them in that EMS training. Um, and so that's kind of the long and short of the board. Um, happy to answer any questions. Okay. And then um, our adolescent mental health network that we received uh, will receive 300000 a year for the next four years. Um, we've already began drawing on that money. And um, the, the kind of the focus of that is for early identification and intervention for children that are experiencing toxic stress. So whether that be uh, issues at home, issues uh, with homelessness, food insecurity, um, and then of course other behavioral health issues that might stem from that. Um, we'll also be partnering with EMS on that project to uh, train them in de-escalation so that if they respond to an adolescent um, experiencing a mental health concern, that we can avoid those uh, unnecessary visits to the emergency department um, for two reasons. Obviously, it's more it's not necessarily cost effective for the hospitals to receive uh, a patient where they are unable to provide services. Um, and secondly, it is found that Unnecessary evening visits in those situations do tend to cause increased trauma and then uh, increased possibility of suicide. So uh, that's again we we'll move toward that project. Happy answer anyway. Ian, do you have your hand up? Do you have a question or is that from before? Legacy. I'll send you legacy. I do have one. So I reached out to Leo earlier about working with Farmington Valley Health also because four or five of our towns are in Farmington Valley Health and they have a parallel initiative going. So I thought it'd be good if the COG to collaborate with Farmington Valley Health it just extends our reach, extends our capability. And you want to make some comments on that? Or? Sure. Uh, yes, actually, I did reach out to Kate at Farmington Valley. Um, and just, you know, a nicely crafted email to say, you know, I spoke with Don, um, we're here, we're kind of doing the same thing. Our, our main focus with our regional fund is to uh, really meet the needs of the smaller towns, recognizing that harm reduction activities that, 
work in Farmington or Winstead may not work in other places um, with a, a different community character, if you will. Um, and so that's, I, I explained that to Kate. Um, her response back was really sweet. It was okay, thanks. Um, you know, the meeting is canceled for today, but we'll let you know. So, um, so we did, I did connect with her. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? Um, regarding the uh, uh, prescription drug program, um, I know our, our uh, social services coordinator has been in contact with uh, Kathy Glasner about that. Uh, and then I, I saw um, Rob's note saying that you're no longer going to, the cops no longer going to support that. Um, have you been in contact with her to work with her or try to find other ways for individuals in Northwest Connecticut to uh, take advantage of some other uh, prescription drug program? I know she still administers the one that's in uh, Dutchess County. Um, and I know that we have, we have a number of people in Northwest to take advantage of that program. And I was just wondering if um, there's any process to move forward with some other type of program. Um, so, so yes, uh, a different program, but not from the COD standpoint. So it turns out that uh, the that prescription assistance program was created for NHCOD became the 21 town region, and it's uh, just simply those. Nine towns, I think, and then kind of have uh, western side, right? northwestern RPA. Yeah, northwestern RPA. And so, uh, at that point, the the COD was a middle man for the northwest RPA, and then we continued when in reality, the NCA can just get funds directly to the municipalities. So while yes, we did have some towns that were uh, heavy hitters, I would say they did use that prescription system program a lot. There were other towns that didn't. So collectively with FCH, we, you know, kind of decided, well, yeah. you know, again, it's like what works for one town doesn't necessarily work for another town. And simultaneously, FCH is also uh, kind of changing their vision or strategy, if you will, slightly, in a sense that they're not looking necessarily to fund the programs, but they'd rather fund the capacity building. So from that standpoint, if let's say that FCA is willing to fund some extra hours for a your social service provider, so that you know maybe instead of 20 hours, they're there at 30 hours. So in that span of 30 hours, rather than just meeting one single need of prescription, they can talk, they can cover many more needs that are all encompassing. So I, I think that's why, you know, part of the reason why collectively we came to that decision. But again, we were the middle man kind of unnecessary. And we were also taking some money off the top for uh, admin costs that could go right to you guys instead. Yeah, the admin cost that we were getting was, was really marginal. And in fact, as we we're spending more time than the admin costs were paying for, that's taking away from the greater cost as far as our uh, ability to you know, spend our time working on the regional initiatives. So it's a little out of balance. But having said that, uh, we were very concerned about the outcome because it's been going on for 20, almost 20 years, I think it is, uh, that there are people that are, you know, kind of counting on that. They don't expect to have the rug, rug pulled out from under them. But as we understand, FCH is going to have listening sessions. I think they may have put in their, in their letter that went out to everybody. So I would highly encourage uh, participating in that because maybe there's something to be worked out if you're a high user of that program. So I think we're happy to help facilitate that in whatever way we, that we, we can. So... Um, yeah, they, they start, they have actually have a, um, a meeting tomorrow, and there's other sessions on the 20th of the form board. Yeah, I mean, if you want us to be involved and in, in kind of um, helping work that out, I think absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, reach out to Leo. Yeah, I'm happy to jump right in Okay. Thanks for anybody else who's uh, obviously interested in that as well. Okay. Um, let's go ahead with uh, the next uh, item. And we'll wait for uh, Jeff to get here. 
uh, recognition to Emily, which I think is very deserved. Yeah, uh, as everybody should know by now, uh, but Emily is, is, is leaving COG. Uh, obviously, for some reasons, I'll let you, you go on that, but um, just extend our appreciation uh, for helping us uh, at a time of real need when we had uh, uh, some turnover at the same time and uh, coming in and helping uh, steady the boat, so to speak. So uh, definitely appreciate it, and uh, I'll stay the here. Oh, you're welcome. I, just, I wanted to just um, send a letter around to each of you, but I'll keep on copy because I could, I, I'll ramble. I'm just going to read this to you <laughs> that um, I really just wanted to take an opportunity to thank all of you for the opportunity to be the deputy director for the last year and a half of the um, Council of Governments. And I am truly committed to regional planning and economic development. I have been for 20 plus years. Um, and I came to the agency really eager to contribute to you all. Um, wanted to help you enhance and maintain the beautiful towns and villages of this area. I really have enjoyed tremendously getting to know each of you and getting to know your communities. And I mean it when I say I've learned something valuable from each of your towns and from each of you listening to your updates every month and um, coming to visit some of you. And um, so I've, I've really taken something away with me as well, whether it's about professionalism or the field of community and economic development. I do believe this region is a gem. I always thought that growing up coming here, but now I've gotten to know it a little bit more intimately and I really I love it up here. We're lucky to have it as a part of the state of Connecticut. Um, so this choice was really hard for me. Um, I had hoped to stay much longer and continue to build um, with the team here. You have a top-notch team in place, but at this time, um, my position as Director of House and Home at my Hillquist residence in West Hartford has to take precedence, so I hope to stay in touch and to learn more about how your towns are growing and thriving into the future. Thank you. Emily, you mentioned the very, very And understand completely the decision. Yeah, yeah Dr. Kitchen. I, I, I think it's I think that you're walking in an opportune moment. I mean I'm not as late as I thought I was. Henry, I have one or two really quick Oh, oh wait, I think yeah. that was part of this too. Oh, okay. All right. Is that okay? Um just really quick. The EDA um EDD designation shift, it's it's still ongoing, but thank you very much for all of the letters of support. They were very helpful. All the documents have been submitted. Um so we just have a couple of other little administrative things with that. But um the, at the time I last talked with our representative, the government was potentially about to shut down. So since that didn't happen, hopefully we're back on a on a fast track to getting that designation. Um, we held an EDC executive committee meeting on September 28th at the chamber. Um, we spoke about the structure and membership of the EDC now that um, the cloud is the EDD. Nothing will really change, but the membership of the EDC um, needs a little bit of a boost. <laughs> so hopefully um, we can work on that coming up here. And um, finally, we did put out an RFP for an engagement consultant for the SEDS. Um, we've, we've gotten a verbal um, uh, commitment of an extension to finish the SEDS into April of 2024, so that should really help out um, with everything. Um, they were understanding that you know they threw this EDD thing at us at the last minute, so it took a little bit of our time. But um, that RFP that we put out for an engagement consultant is due back, the proposals are due back on the 25th of October, so well, to be accepting those in and hopefully someone can come on that help out. With that yeah, and, and if I can jump in on that yeah, note, um, I, I actually posted the position uh, yesterday and uh, with an aggressive uh, deadline on that. Uh, so we're, we're hopeful that we can kind of uh, get that, that ball moving in that direction and not really miss any time. So uh, just to, just an update there. But the other, uh, uh, that Emily mentioned about the membership of the Northwest Connecticut uh, ADC. Uh, we have a uh, executive committee meeting after this meeting, and that's one of the topics of, on the agenda is to uh, basically talk about the membership, uh, the mission, the, the you know the the the, the reason that for, for their board's existence, and uh, as part of a kind of a in our bylaws a, spe a special committee, uh, and uh, it has a lot of latitude. So the idea is to have that executive committee kind of work on that and establish uh, the EDC as a subcommittee of the COG, 
um, that basically would review all the, the, the budgetary information, everything they did before um, this change to, with the EDB, and uh, basically just recommend it to the NHK to form approvals. So that's really the only change. So we'll have that in the discussion on the executive committee meeting. So we can keep that moving forward too. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Dr. Ditchin. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad I was my head uh, up in Torrington. Uh, final set of meetings with legislators about something I'll talk about just in for a few minutes this morning. But I'd ask Rob just for the opportunity to address the board just to say welcome. Um, we are excited to have the COG in our building. And Rob and I have talked more about this. And in fact, that this makes our part of the state extremely unique, I think. The fact that the rest and the COGS are going to cooperate and collaborate in this nature to the extent that we're even sharing space. So I'm absolutely certain we are unique across Connecticut. Um, Rob's colleagues and mine, I think, um, you know, many people have talked to talk around regional efficiencies, but it's, it, it's it often the conversation just the wheels spin and nothing really happens. Um, and uh, this is just, uh, in my opinion, I think a no brainer for this region that we can combine our forces here in this building. We can make some of the things that we have here um, accessible to the Northwest Hills COD and be more efficient and effective than we're just build the uh, move the transition went well. We, we've been taking full advantage of the IT services. There you go. <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, I hear you talk about grant applications and things like that. And you know, as a as a larger organization um, and with a larger infrastructure, we have uh, we have a lot of capacity to help. I think in a lot of ways, um, like with IT and other things, and we can, we can certainly uh, explore all of those in the future. So we're just excited, and it's one of the opportunities to let you know uh, that we're going to the top to officially. To at advance in our which field facility. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things that I'll give you an update on is something uh, it's a new initiative we're really excited about. It was the reason I was up in Torrington today. Uh, earlier this year, um, at advance purchased uh, the East School facility in Torrington from the city of Torrington, worked with Mayor Cardone and the, and the Board of Ed and the school district. We had lease space in that facility for three or four years to run a regional program for special education students with significant behavioral needs. We serviced about 50 kids in that program at any given time, 30 to 35 are from Torrington, the other 15 to 20 are from other school districts in Northwest Connecticut. Um, and you know, the building had been abandoned by the board bed there for about eight years. Um, you know, we always joked it was in really bad shape. We were, you know, basically one toilet malfunction away from each other and the whole building down. So we purchased it earlier this year. We've invested about five million dollars into the facility so far. Um, new roof, new HVAC, new windows, new lighting, new flooring, um, renovating the entire building and are trying to get legislative and governmental support for what uh, will take up the rest of that space. I'll pass around these are hot off the press marketing brochures. Um, and it, it checks a lot of boxes in many areas, not just K-12 education. So the College and Career Accelerator program that we've established up there, we um, hired two administrators so far to help get this going. It will serve as options for high school students across the region. We are not looking to get into the magnet school business. Um, I, I've been here for eight years now. I'm here because Ed Advance is unique across the state. We're the only rest that's not in the magnet school business. I've probably had hundreds, if not thousands, of conversations with the 29 superintendents I work with in Northwest Connecticut, and not once has one of them asked me to get into the magnet school business. I don't want districts students and we don't want districts funding. We see this as an opportunity to provide options for high school kids and to meet workforce needs at the same time. So college and career accelerators will start off with four pathways. The, the analogy we're using is like a route eight analogy. And we've got four lanes so far of this highway. Um, Manufacturing and engineering technology is one of those pathways. 
We see education and early childhood education specifically as another, um, healthcare profession as another, and public service or public safety. So giving kids the opportunity to take high school credit and college credit courses to lead them towards gainful employment opportunities even before they're out of high school for higher paying jobs and certainly give them an opportunity to explore something other possibly than a four-year college path if they're interested. Um, we have uh, modeled the program after uh, a program in Hamden that Dan Cochiola, who's the director of the program, I hired him away from Hamden. He developed a manufacturing program there that had 125 students in it. Many of those students by their junior year had part-time jobs making $25, $30 an hour in things like welding, CAD, and other manufacturing certification programs. Many of those students now are graduating with somewhere between 20 and 60 credits from um, Gateway Community College down there. We are partnering with Northwest Community College to try to provide some of the same opportunities. We have a lot of the structure in place to do this already. We've got 85 vans that crisscross school districts every day, so you can get kids to different programs. But we want to provide traction for both the K for all for the K-12 world, business community, the workforce development people. A lot of well-meaning conversations and a lot of well-meaning funding and a lot of wheel spinning. And uh, we feel that at advance and the college career accelerated program up in that building can be that traction for all those different entities. And we're excited about it. Um, you know, uh, that we can get kids and get existing teachers and programs, get kids access to those programs. So, uh, you know, great examples, our team had a meeting with one of our districts last week. They've got a really talented physics teacher um, in a very small high school, full-time physics teacher who has also been trained in the same mechatronics. And I'm, I'm not an engineer, but it's somewhere along the lines of the science of working on machines that fix other machines or create other machines. I don't know, but it's a complicated engineering um, field, I guess. And he's been trained. He can teach courses to high school kids. But he's in a small high school, and it's not unlike five or six high schools in our region. You know, he's a full-time physics teacher, teach four or five classes a day, and you're not one of those classes that have more than eight to ten kids in. So at some point, that community, that board of ed is going to have to make a decision. Do we cut that position to part-time, lose the teacher? Do we try to maintain the funding and, you know, have ultimately that teacher realize the writing's on the wall and, you know, go, not to not always pick on Darian, but realize that Darian's going to pay her or him $20,000, $30,000 more than they're making right now. And we lose that capacity in our region. What I would say to that district is let the college and career program get involved. Let us fund that program. We can even partially fund that teacher. And all you have to do is allow us to get kids from surrounding high schools access to that class. We can have him teach in 20 kids, period, because now he's got three kids from Watertown, four kids from Litchfield, and three kids from Oxford or you know, fill in the blank. So that's the kind of thing this program will do. Another big piece would be helping high schools organize um, uh, work experience and internships, which is something that the government and the, the, the Department of Ed is trying to come on into. But again, at a small high school, there's no traction for that. Nobody to organize that and to make partnerships with uh, with the, the, the um, business community and uh, the workforce side to find them. So um, we're excited about this program. It has it checks a lot of boxes and has a lot more um, to offer this this uh, this part of our state um, than just the K twelve world. And while superintendents are really excited, and we've got five or six districts that I, you know, can't wait for us to get going. My ask has been, I've met with about a dozen legislators now, I finished with a couple more this morning, to say, the minute I have to send an invoice to a school district or a board of ed for this program, it's, it dies on the bottom. Communities don't have the funding to do this, and they're, they're losing the capacity to do it themselves. So the state should fund this. And the analogy I've been using is over the last three years, the other five rests who work in other parts of the state 
between magnet school funding and relief funding through our investor money through the state. On the high side, at FRET, which has um, you know received about uh, half a billion dollars, plus the five hundred million dollars from granted. So apples to oranges. Greater Hartford to Northwestern Connecticut. I understand that. Um, and but even in the other corner, in the eastern corner, East Town, which does the same kind of work, we are very magnet school business. So they received about twelve million dollars over the last few years. That advance has got me a little less than four hundred thousand dollars, and we only got two hundred and fifty of that because I complained so long and so hard to the state department that we didn't get any relief from it. And it's apples to oranges, is what the legislators point out to me, and I quickly point out to them: well, it's apples to apples when you think about both of those pots of money are designed to provide opportunities for kids. And Northwest Connecticut is missing out on that opportunity. That's an equity issue for me, and that's what I'm, I'm trying to force on to them. And just warning them now that come December, January, February, March, I will be knocking on their door to try to rectify that through this program. Um, and we will do everything we can to get, to get grant funding, other foundation funding, federal funding. I'll, I'll, you know, we'll beat every um, every drum and every even knock on every door, but I think the state needs to step up to make this sustainable and not have the burden of being able to provide opportunities like this fall on local boards of education. That's my still pop speech, so I think it's a more time to pull. Well, I'll promise you about five minutes. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you for having us. No, okay, thank, thank, you. thank you for having me. And uh, like I said, I, this, this, from the minute Rob and I talked about it, you know, so this is such a great idea. Right? Yeah, I'll just add, I think that's a great idea where, I know I'm literally over, working on a merger right now, but we kind of have so many classes right. um, that have not been available to AP classes from a lot of our students because they're just not enough students. Right. So um, I think having this kind of opportunity for, for yeah, it, it, it also brings up a point I should have mentioned. You know, like part of like I said, I, I use that physics teacher example, but you know, one thing we, we, we absolutely don't want to do is you know, we've got great high school programs here in the, in the case of Bohack and Botech and the state technical high school and joint and both tech. We're not looking to do what they do. We 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 can certainly help them gain access to more kids to keep those programs sustainable by driving kids around the region, helping them make uh, virtual classes of possibility so that kids maybe don't have to leave their high school and they can take a BOA class at some point. And, uh, you know, but they sit in Torrington and normally wouldn't have access to that. I, I think those are the kind of opportunities that uh, that's the kind of thing RESC should do and we can do. Thank you. Any other questions? Any questions online or comments? I can tell you, I, I definitely appreciate, uh, and it's, it, we're already taking advantage of potentially some cybersecurity, uh, and, you know, improvements for us as, a, as an organization, which is really important. Uh, and uh, I mean, so it's beyond IT too as well, but uh, just the, the look and feel. I mean, it just, we just feel really legitimized, I guess, that's the way I can kind of describe it. Um, it's just, it's like an infusion of energy. You got people around here, uh, not just us, in a building and it's just kind of inspiring. So uh, it's just uh, everything in every way is great. So, and, and in the end, we all work towards the same thing, making the communities we serve in this region better. So whether it's on the municipal side or the, or the school district side, it's the same function, so it makes so much sense and could be a model for other parts of the state, but we're not gonna worry about getting that. So, we're in the same market. Good, so. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe someday in the future you can uh, show us that he's school. I would love to. Anytime. Yeah, we can set that up if we want to go up. Uh, we, we finished the renovation in half. We moved downstairs now for the piece that, because we had to fix the part that we had to before I had September, but uh, we're working on that. And that's that's why I've been making the legislative meeting up there so I can feel that. Um, had a meeting yesterday with uh, with uh, in charge of the former speaker of the house and the uh, renewable energy business and everything about trying to and going the possibility of uh, of electric vehicles and electric charging.
training stations and kind of the teaching and learning and workforce development that might develop around that. So there's all kinds of things that, that happen up there now that we don't. And, it, and, and that's what ultimately allowed us to have the space here to do this too. We were uh, an entire built in department of the floor. Yeah. Yep. And our, our road sign is underway. Yeah, around the way. That'd be great. We yeah. get the signage up and everything else. <laughs> we're going to slide right in rather than that. So it'll just work out nice. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank, Thank you very much. It's great. Thank you. Uh, uh, John Field can't be here today. Uh, you'll find on your on your email if you haven't seen it, there is a report that John sent. Uh, I encourage you all to read it. If you have any questions about it, contact John directly. <laughs> yeah, you can, or you can contact and I can share. I can uh, I can you know carry it over. Okay, we'll uh, move on to the. Uh, Municipal forum. We'll start. Why don't we start with Matt? Well, I'll keep this short. And uh, it's been, it's actually been very quiet in Marlboro lately. Um, I'm not changing something. <laughs> well, our okay. guest still is almost all cleaned up, but we still have some things we have to work on. Watch the area. There's some spots we have to still work on. Um, we're in the process now of one of our other projects is to build a new firehouse. And we've been going through the planning and zoning and wetlands process for that. And we were extremely happy that we've been in touch with Maria Horn for a number of months now. And we secured funding through the uh, Bond Commission uh, for two and a half million dollars to assist us in building our new firehouse. We actually have a meeting uh, on Saturday, the 21st, um, headed up by our commit, our firehouse committee and a uh, few residents um, to start a capital campaign. So we're hoping that that will generate, you know, fairly good chunk of money as well. So that's the process. And, um, uh, other than that, fixing roads and Leaning up his bills and other things, but things are good. And uh, so I've kind of been telling you the last meeting that we did, uh, the last few meetings, uh, we did finalize uh, our sale of our water and sewer for $8 million. So effective October 2nd, the partner is no longer in the ownership and control of our water and sewer plants Prairie has taken over. They were already running the facility. Uh, the net result is that uh, all the water customers uh, will see rates that are about 15% lower than the municipal rates and the sewer will be 10% uh, lower. Through subsidy, our pine metal and aquifer should be sewered with the funds. Uh, so it's really, Great long term move for us. A lot of capital can come in through a query. And the first thing right off the gate, they'll do $135,000 or $130,000 or so in meters. You know, for what was a $680,000 or $700,000 operation, you know, for them to try to generate another $135,000 or $140,000 capital to replace meters is just untenable. So, uh, it seems to be a good thing to start seeing more stuff about the uh, press. And I'm sure that the prayer will be trying to use the new Hartford acquisition to coax other communities to consider the opportunity to do that. It's just when you don't have scale in most things, it's, it's like small businesses trying to compete with Amazon or Walmart. New Hartford just didn't have the ability, uh, the professional uh, support staff to do the billing, to do the compliance, to do the reporting. And then, of course, the state. Uh, with their prevailing wage rate and public finance rules, every time you try to do a job, uh, you've got to pay 40% more than they would do it, where Prairie doesn't have to do that. So everything in this state makes things hard on that. It, and a lot of the jobs, the small fixes for uh, community water resource system, uh, people don't want to look at it because there's just no money in it. From there, you know, to do a 15 or $20,000 repair, it's hard to get people to even look at that and then have it. So we we're happy to complete that and we see good things happening. Hopefully it's our, our primary downtown 44 
quarter, which is our business district. So hopefully it has some economic development segue and businesses will pay lower fees to be in that area. Uh, with regard to John Field, I know that he's been pushing that statewide exercise. He's also been pushing that um, uh, the LEOP that he's been trying to get everybody to do by the end of the year. Uh, one of the things within the LEOP that he's been trying to do that we just successfully completed was the continuity of government provision. A lot of small towns in the northwest corner are uh, very small, uh, non redundant management structures where it's basically the selected is the sole manager in the organization. And there's always this what if something happens to any one of us? Who has the spending authority? Who has the personnel authority? So we just completed a um, a uh, program where we uh, created a secondary position. Uh, we made the administrative assistant position to the first elected and entry level position and created an executive level assistant for employees that have either the experience five years of administrative authority or experience in that position or come to us with management. We added that management overlay with a spending authority and budget items, about $100,000 management supervision rights uh, in the absence or in the capacitation of the first selection. So that if there are issues that are unforeseen uh, that exceed 100,000 and go to select them, you know, but if it's day-to-day -day operations in the budget, it's first order under 100,000, that gives that executive level assistance the autonomy to be able to manage people, purchase things, uh, and deal with that so that we have continuity. So uh, the last thing is, you know, one of the big things we worked out for the last couple of years is the fire department uh, merger that I told you all about the time that a fire district no longer exists. And now I'm very clear, we had three, so now we're down to two. Uh, now we're talking about uh, possibly dealing with another merger and maybe going to one. But uh, I know that there's some people that are uneasy about one of our fire districts. So uh, we'll see where that all goes. Uh, I think that the long and the short of it is that it's getting harder and harder in 2023 to go forward to generate volunteers. And we all have in our communities a vast number of uh, uh, new residents that have come to us from other locations, whether it's New York or Boston or wherever they are, who still have not engaged the community. But we've lost a lot of the, what I call the old school volunteers that have been on the fire department or been volunteering for the ambulance or different boards of commissions. And I think that's one of our primary focuses is how do we engage and bring in uh, the new residents who want to be involved. It always seems like their first sole focus is schooling their children, but trying to get them to take that next leap to get involved with the um, admin of small town and how they just participate, whether it's the library board, fire department, or economic development commission, or parks of rec, or whatever that is, to try to bring new energy to getting involved in the community. So we're going to be really increasing our outreach and marketing campaign to get people to come in. We see that as one of the biggest challenges on a basis. So that, you know, when you talk about, you know, that really prioritizing that EDC, the interest rates spiking, we're seeing that starting to crimp on small businesses. You know, people are starting to slow down. So we're trying to, you know, put more energy into that focus because that's we see as a challenge for the I have a question. At your board of commission, you have a, a pretty good demographic. There's a split, or is it mostly a certain age group? Or you know, it's always hard to get younger people involved. Uh, it is harder to get younger people involved. Uh, the average age of our volunteers on our boards of commissions, I would have to say, is in the sixty-five to seventy range. Just in time. Been, been recording. I hear it must have said yeah, it. Well, now that we're recording, I guess I'll be able to talk.
Thanks. Yeah. Everything you said applies to, <laughs> to our town as well. I think our average age on our boards and commissions is 70 to 80. And it's hard to get we have the same demographic problem here. Real estate is well said, we have people outside of the state that are buying these properties. And it's very hard to get them engaged into the community in certain things. And we say they're still on that. <laughs> That's a good term. Yeah. Uh, we have three bridge projects underway right now. With any luck at all, they'll all be done before the end of November, provided we don't have any more weather related effects known as flooding. Only one is gone over budget, which is understandable in the story of the project, and it all has to do with funding. the funding. Uh, we're still working on it. We for challenge. The challenge for me is the our emergency management director, obviously, is a part time volunteer fireman, and that's a full time job. It's very hard to get him to do that sitting down. Wrap, fill it all square. Other than that, I appreciate all the help that I've gotten from the other selectmen in the uh, one term that I've been here. And uh, Emily, I'm right there with you. I'm Retired for the third time. <laughs> Look forward to staying home. Take care of your company. And I really call them. I'll go and let them. And for those that want to get good luck. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, just need to stop reading. Uh, we're out there. We got Green Bay Hard on uh, uh, July 16th and, and uh, September 13th and the 29th. Um, reached out to Rob and John Field and uh, started doing applications with Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, we have one particular stream down uh, right in, through Rock Ferry that uh, is completely washed out and now it's starting to uh, jeopardize the homes and people within there. Uh, had some good luck reaching out to the Department of Agriculture and our two guests. Um, we've had three big groups of visits to town and walking the stream line, and up with some remediation, trying to open up the stream again, trying to salvage the houses that are all in the historic district um, in town. So it's kind of taken uh, what was normally going to be our plan for the year. Uh, we've had a lot of washout. Um, we've gone through uh, an immense amount of fill. We have 25 miles of dirt roads. Uh, and I think we're up to about 3,000 tons of material to be brought in uh, just since July 16th. Um, so some of our bridges have moved forward. We have one large bridge project that's uh, 6,000 yards of material came out of the river home in 2016 in the ground. Uh, it's been washed out several times now. Actually, great contract routine. So I've got a bad we're still on time and still on budget, which is crazy. Um, so we're trying to wrap up the same thing. Uh, we've got a lot of open projects and uh, a lot of things to fix before it starts to freeze. Um, we're also uh, working on getting an ambulance building. Um, and actually, uh, just to touch on what you said about volunteers, um, I've been at a couple functions recently with uh, uh, some residents that we're going to form a committee uh, so we can get more of these volunteers and new people. Uh, they started throwing house parties around the town to try and get a committee together. Um, they like to start a community center. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of uh, you know, IT interests. Uh, and, and doing something computer based because we have very uh, interesting talent in town. Uh, and I hope Kim Britt isn't on that, but they're sick of giving it to Washington. They want to keep them on Roxbury. So um, we're hoping to uh, move that board in the next year to uh, have a community center uh, teaching training classes uh, as they say. But um, other than that, I wish everybody loved this uh, <laughs> going through your election and those that serve. Thank you. One second, we just lost the uh, yeah. I think uh, Mayor, you can hear us right still. I can hear. Okay, good. Yeah, we just lost the overhead projector in here, so we're going to try and get that fixed. But uh, the meeting is still going. So, to be uh, yes. yeah. so I think I'm the only one that's running with an phone, right? This, Let's just start asking my new date, so all good. Sure. Uh, 
Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, we, of course, in the folks deal with the similar um, concerns of volunteers. And um, we have added five new uh, volunteer boards, and we've been fortunate to have 50 new volunteers, but that doesn't stop the, the committees that have been longstanding for a long time that they also are up in ages that are much older. And I'd love to get some of the younger generation to participate, but understand that, you know, the commitments of work and family life, it's sometimes near impossible to try to, you know, join them. That's why I think sort of it's, it, when needed is a, is a good uh, option. Um, I'm spending a lot of my time on the school merger right now. It's a little different, I think, for the other um, three towns that we are merging with, which deal with uh, Warren Morris and Goshen, and that we have to take all our Litchfield property and transfer ownership over to the new Region 20. And um, just taking out, having to do a survey now to take out some of the solar that we put in so that we can retain uh, control over that is taking um, a lot of legal expenses and time. Uh, we do have a solar project going in at the WPCA. Um, so you know that we're going to hopefully reduce their electric bill from you know, usually around $3,500 a month down to a more reasonable level. Um, we are finishing up our drainage projects and paving projects. We have a lot of that going on, and uh, we recently uh, have been working to get that uh, eight years of money that we uh, we finished projects, but the state hasn't reimbursed us, so we're just getting that money now for a project that was made years ago. And like everybody, we, um, the results of all the water we had sinkholes, emergency sinkholes, a lot of our public works that have come out on nights and weekends to try to work in. You know, um, open roads that have been closed because of the heavy dangerous. So that's it. And I'm going to the DOT right now. They just a traffic study in the center of town so that we can try to figure out how to make our three or four uh, state highways, 63, 202, 118, and 254, safer for uh, pedestrians and vehicles. That's it. Good okay. luck in your campaign. And yeah. Give me some signs. I'll take them back. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody. It's been a great uh, what, six, six years of being sitting on the board. Uh, had a lot of great friends. Other people, it's been great, great experience. You know, I'm going to miss it. Probably not. But, uh, <laughs> I'll keep track. <laughs> on that. Um, I noticed last month I uh, reported that we had an incident at Gone Hall. Um, bad incidents and about two to three weeks ago, that father passed away. He, uh, he had an OD. Uh, he got out of jail, he got back, and was kind of withdrawal, and uh, he died on it right away. It was an OD on that part. But, uh, so, uh, you know, it wasn't official, but I got that to the trooper, but it's sad. It's uh, it just unfortunately how it happened. Uh, so, it's a menace on our side that we need to be kind of now. You know, it's bad on one end and you know, on the other side. And it's too bad it happened. Um, on that part, um, I, one of the reasons I stayed on a little longer is get a final Union Rail Station rebuild. We had it done in 2017. Still waiting for the state to get final payments. They were almost over 200000 It's been unbelievable. Um, I told by the end of October, we got paid, and every two weeks I emailed and doing that. But couldn't understand why I haven't gotten paid. I emailed him the other day, and he said, Well, we're still working on it. So they keep changing the, the, the subject all the time. Or, the time right? So I'm hoping that they'll get paid back. And it's one of the big things that since 2017, when we had our railroad station for another day, which has been a battle, an unreal battle for the state. Um, and it was sad that we got turned down by FEMA for our roads. I know Matt and Norfolk, I had a couple, and uh, it cost us over $200,000. Uh, Someone was going to get money to do that, and you know, FEMA didn't come through, so unfortunately. Um, I know I didn't fly to the fall, uh, I guess, to the northwest corner. But there was a lot of damages throughout the state, and it was very sad, you know. Not much else going on. We do have a presenting a plane named Sony presented a, uh, a developer with the 20 homes, high end five acre lots uh, at a public hearing. It was probably close to 100 people at it. Most people have been in the town hall for quite a while for a public meeting. We had to open up our back uh, 
back ends are ready to fit in there. Uh, it was a lot of pros and cons, uh, some good stuff. I think on my part, it would be great for the town. Uh, it's going to be some more revenue for us to come in, but there's opposition because it was a dying river, it's both by. Uh, so they got another public, got another public hearing 13th of next month on it. Uh, but again, the developers got to get back to some of the comments that the public made, some applications they claim they didn't make, but. But it's going to be interesting. Um, and uh, this is about it. We've got it quiet except for that. And uh, hopefully, for the next for November 7th. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but again, yeah, I'd like to thank everybody. It's been a great, it's been a great run. I enjoyed everybody. I had a lot of good friends and contacts. And, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Morris, we just. Wrapping up our East Shore Road Zone K project, uh, that was partially funded through a five hundred thousand dollars seed grant. Uh, able to utilize those millings at our Town Beach parking lot and driveway, our boat launch parking lot and driveway, more cemetery drive, and our town garage. Thank you a lot of uh, use of all that material that came off the road. And we also just received notification about another seed grant for the John White Road Bridge for a half a million dollars. So quite a bit to pay for that bridge. Our LEOD is almost done, thanks to our EMD, uh, Dave Barton, our executive assistant, Marl Gelati. And our Windy and Inn from Morris was named the top destination spot in the United States. So, <laughs> um, so my last day is going to be October 20th. Uh, Bob Geiger will be the interim town manager and he'll be here at your next meeting. Uh, certain firms have been hired. They're based out of New Hampshire, but um, they'll be conducting the executive search for find the next town manager. If you know anybody, make sure they apply. Um, with my life has been really grabbing up grants, 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 grants everywhere. So we have a huge challenge grant that we're still um, operating on. We have some congressionally directed spending grants, maybe a couple more in the works that we're really able to pick up. Um, and uh, we, we also, with our infrastructure improvement plan, another $24.7 million invested into bridges, roads, uh, and a few other items, including a ladder, trap, and sidewalks. Um, we have five roads. Uh, totally reconstructed as we speak, and we have a bridge that's um, also being totally reconstructed right now. So traffic in downtown Winston has been a little rough, but we're getting by. Um, one of my personal accomplishments in my time in Winstead, for any of you who talked to Bob Geiger about this, uh, you'll know that this is a huge boom for him too. We are no longer the smallest town in Connecticut with some service commission. Uh, we've been able to uh, move away from that model and move towards the models that all of you have adopted, which is the more professional management uh, of hiring uh, practices within your town. So I'm uh, very pleased about that. Um, and But we have moved towards uh, some additional commissions and we have been looking for more volunteers. So while we've gotten rid of civil service, we now have a historic commission uh, that's really been developed in lieu of uh, an active historical society in our town to try and make sure that the town has more of a purview over the historic assets um, within within our territory. Um, we're working on cultural district designation right now in downtown Winstead. No guarantee that that's going to come to fruition, but it will involve the creation of another commission. Um, and in order to try and get more people energized, if anybody's interested in this, please reach out and let me know because I, I have a bit of a template on how we put this together. Uh, the town of Winchester right now is holding a Citizens Academy. It's a 12-week program um, where we are inviting individuals to, anybody from the public up to 25 individuals at a time can come sign up for these courses and they attend each course uh, once a week, two hours. And each course is designed to focus on a different area. So last night I was over at the water and sewer plants with uh, our, our enrollees. And it, I, I think a lot of folks thought it was just going to be the board of select and the board of ed folks signing up so that they had yet another thing on the resume. But it really is. Um, the mayor's been involved, and that's great. Uh, but besides that, it's really been folks who aren't engaged or on our board and commission. And they're getting involved, they're getting uh, informed. Um, and a lot of comments are being made to me about, wow, how can we help make that better, how can we help uh, enhance the services, whatever the case might be. 
uh, I really recommend um, that every town consider offering something like that, even if you don't need a full 12 weeks to go through your departments. Um, some educational opportunity would be a good thing. Um, we've also, we, yesterday we held a regional job fair, thanks to anybody who was connected and involved, I know the Burlington PD was involved, um, and it was great to see so many businesses there. I hope that some of your town's businesses uh, benefit from that as well. Uh, we also had a first-time homebuyer seminar that was held last night. Uh, that's been recorded and put on the Town of Winchester's YouTube channel, but it is really universal information if anybody wants to link to it on your websites. Um, especially given the high rents, and this is maybe more of a Winstead and Torrington problem than it is in a lot of other communities, but with so many rental units in Winstead, we're getting very concerned about the high rents and trying to encourage people to understand you might be able to pay an equal amount or less on a mortgage instead of uh, continuing to pay somebody else's mortgage for them. Um, so that's available for your review and use. Um, within grants, I should have mentioned before, we the town of Winchester did just receive or was just notified of a $250,000 steep grant, which will help to repair the old Bank of America building that exists um, at 44 Allen Street. So it's within the walkable downtown area. And the goal is to create an under one new social service center. Um, and we've had a lot of conversations between several agencies. Um, the town, Greenwoods, um, Counseling and Referrals, New Opportunities, the McCall Foundation, all interested in having a satellite office at this site. Um, so it's going to be a great resource for Winstead and surrounding towns, especially. Um, and I'm very excited to see that move forward. I think the last thing I want to mention is the town's going through, and this was approved a while ago, but it does look like we're going to be successful uh, in completing the sale of about 1,250 acres of conservation easements on town owned lands and water company lands, the water, water, Winchester water and sewer land uh, between now and early 2024. So we're selling those conservation easements to the state of Connecticut, they'll hold them, um, and the town will receive $750,000 uh, in exchange for the preservation of them. And it's immediately around them in the water reservoir. So that's a big accomplishment for the town. They've been trying to do that for about the last 15 years. Um, that, those are, that's my last update. Thank you. <laughs> it's been great. Chuck, I just have one question. Uh, did you, were you soliciting the state to buy those guys? What was the, back? I don't know what started all of this, but somewhere back in the 2005 to 10 time frame, um, and, and don't forget Winchester was having its own hiccups at, at that time. <laughs> um, but there was a conversation that was started in town about um, using Highlands Act money to help uh, preserve the land that's in and around the, the drinking water facility and, and the reservoirs that we have. There were concerns that were brought up at the time. My understanding of the reason it was voted down was because people were afraid that by using Highlands funds, you were guaranteeing access to that land for passive recreation, which would allow for terrorists to access the reservoir. That was actually in some minutes that I read, so that was very interesting. Um, we're, I'm not really concerned about that at this time, and I, I'm very happy to see that we'll have this preserved because there's no realistic development that we can put in that area and preserve our drinking water at the same time. Uh, so this is absolutely the best path forward for Winchester and, and I think the environment here. Right, um, we have the same problem with volunteers. I may be the oldest one in the room, but there's a lot of people not far behind me. Um, the main thing I'm doing right now is focusing on a number of grants. We've been fortunate in seek grants and the community foundation and others to have a number of projects going. And I guess, even though I've been doing this a long time, I have a couple of frustrations. One is I've never dealt with the Department of Public Health before. And extension to the water line from Winstead into our camps that is turning into the most amazingly complex process I've ever seen. And so the, the, finally, I think we're working through that. And one of the things, and I know we talked about this at a previous meeting, is I will probably go with the Capital Region Person Council, the Gordian Group, who pre qualified contractors for construction. You don't have to go out to bid. They're pre-qualified. They have a standard price list for operations. And not going out to open bid and dealing with all the mountains of paper you have to deal with. And I think they'll probably be as cheap or cheaper than a public bid. So we're working on using them. And that also cuts through a lot of the red tape of CHRO and the Department of Public Health. And the Department of Public Health resisted 
but the Gordian group and uh, the Capital Region Purchasing Council they convinced them that this was a legitimate way to hire a contractor to do a public works project funded by the state. I felt I felt good about that. The other thing is I see CHRO getting more and more active and aggressive in dealing with public works projects. We uh, we loaned the money to repave the road. And we used the Colossal Group, which was on the state bid list, which again, I think would pre-qualify them. Well, CHRO, sorry, was not happy with that. Yeah. They, they need, Colossal Group was not happy with that either. I think we ended up resolving it. But again, it's kind of your bureaucratic red tape that just makes things much harder to accomplish than you need to do. Um, the other thing, and I don't know what you want to talk about, Rob. This town is also. Awesome. What? This town is a and low, so. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But in any case, um, a number of us sat on the conversation yesterday. Uh, there is an organization, uh, and the organization I left eight months ago, Mira, they now have a new commission called the Mira Dissolution Authority. So instead of it being the uh, Innovative and you know resource. It's how do you get rid of Miro? But the, the bottom line for for the eleven communities in the COD is that Miro is going out of business. The contract we have for disposal of solid waste, those contracts will expire at the end of uh, July one twenty seven. Uh, right now, the Torrington Transfer Station services those eleven towns. It's owned by Miro. It's actually, I think Rob told me it's in Harlington, but I think the COG has a need for at least those 11 towns to consider what the next steps are. There's not going to be a new waste energy facility in the state for a number of years, if ever. And so right now we're shipping from, we're paying the different forms into Pennsylvania, West Virginia, wherever. And so I would recommend, and I don't know how you want to handle it, that there be a subcommittee of the COD to look at options, at least for those other towns, the towns that already go to Bristol or have another solution. Like I know Toronto signed on with a private contract to dispose of their waste. But I think it's important to this region because we have so many very small towns that we figure out what the next step is for solid waste disposal. And to be honest, since I resigned from here eight months ago, I haven't even repented for a second. <laughs> I, I would think that's one of the things that when you have the new top board in place, that those towns that are mirror members take a serious look at either forming a regional authority or what else they can do to minimize the cost and potential crisis in getting rid of solid waste. Yeah, I mean, the push, I think, uh, at least the message I kind of got was they're, they're really pushing for regional solution, each individual uh, region, right? If I have that correct. Oh, uh, yeah, Deep is pushing for regional solutions. The other COG members, I mean, I'm here, members, are 12 towns in southeastern Connecticut, but they have a Provanza plant there. They have a transfer station in Essex, and it's all in place that they can just put the legal agreements in place. So they have a different problem than we do. We don't have any good solution. And also, I don't think Mirror owns the Essex Transfer Station. Or at least the land in which the Essex Transfer Station is on is owned by the town of Essex. So, it, you know, there's legal issues, but at least they have a Kawanta burn plant right there. So I think it's going to be, it's not a crisis yet. It's going to become one unless there's some uh, serious action taken for those 11 towns that are still members of Mirror. Yeah, and I think the deadline being 2027 seems like it's all the way, but it's really not when you start thinking about the, the complexity of the situation. And DEP does have grants that I'm aware of. I don't know the magnitude or how easy they are to get to help do the planning for creating a regional authority. That's something, that's something we can do. Well, yeah, your, your words are the most dangerous words that they've been used for the last decade. This is, we have a committee, it's Mike and the legislative committee. This is one of the biggest failures out of Hartford for the last decade that they've screwed this over so bad. And ultimately, what will happen is just that you have limited capacity and it'll become a bidding one. Okay, so it'll be towns like New Hartford or whatever saying to the Cobain plants, I don't care who you're dealing with, I'll pay you $10 a month. Because if the state's going to tax us at $5 a month and take it out of state, we're just going to take that money and do whatever. 
But this, you know, I don't know what's better scientifically, put it in the air by burning it and bury it in the wind, the full terrible solution in terms of long term. But there, we used to take care of our stuff in house here in Connecticut. And to take that off the table was a huge mistake. And this could have been done statewide. You know, when I first started with the cost of a high school, okay, for 150 million, this could have been solved 15 years ago. And now it's some 600 or 700 million dollar problem. That's really, you know, not a good answer. Uh, and there's not enough legislative support behind. That's ridiculous. Okay, so this is really the legislative committee. Got to make some noise on it because this is you're right, box ticket. So before you know it, you know what happens in small communities? They'll be just dumping their trucks on the side of the room. Okay. And that's what the state will have provided. The lack of leadership on this issue through all the way up to the top of the DEP has been terrible. Okay, and, and it will happen, it, but it's going to have to get a little expensive and a little ugly before it's solved. Well, we all know, listen, we're already picking up the tires for TVs, right? Well, are your TV, your TVW's doing all right? Because I know I have. <laughs> Yeah. There's two parts to that, Dan. I think one is the legislative solution, and they, they indeed have not done anything to solve the problem the last 12 years. And I was on the mirror board, despite an area where a number of potential solutions, not 150 million, but the numbers that they need to down to our high school construction or whatever. So the legislative is the only part of it. I think we, we as a group of towns have to be proactive to try to come up with a on our own. We at least even if it's an interim solution, that's still on July 1 of 27, you're not looking around saying, well, what am I going to do with my trash? Because then you do have the problem with the spread. So I, you know, I think that's got to be one of the priorities coming up. And I know Curtis was on the phone, the, the gentleman who runs the Sheriff Salisbury transfer station was on. And it turns out the new administrator for RDD, which is New Hartford Park Camps on Wednesday, is a mayor. Who also has experience with solid waste and work with beer. So I, I think you have a start if you can get a group of people to really look at what the state has to offer and kind of get around the problem while the state is given. Our fine work stretch to get very expensive. Mm -hmm. Very dirty on that path. Henry. Oh, um, I don't know what to say here. I, and does everybody remember the last words in uh, Gone with the Wind as Clark Gable is going down the stairs? <laughs> Miss Scarlett O'Hara. No, uh, I do give a damn. Um, but in our town, we're starting a, we're, we're actually putting a historical commission in, uh, in our town. Uh, we always have had a historical district but we want to give the historical commission a a voice in the chain of PNC uh, and building rulings, so that uh, so we don't get appropriateness like that. <laughs> right. Uh, we, one thing that we've been very successful on in the last few years is we've gotten a lot of younger people on our board, and I don't mean necessarily people that are 23 uh, but and we also launched a, a, a program that really I, i've worked very hard on is trying to get uh people that have moved up to our town uh, on a permanent basis to get involved in the government of the town and to take an active role and it's been fairly successful uh, uh, I do have that we're selling our uh, firehouse. We have a, a sales agreement for $300,000 as is. Uh, and what we're doing is that we're having two elections. We're having an election for registered voters uh, at our town hall, as we normally do. But we're also having a grand list, a town meeting at the same time so that we ensure that more people actually vote. Uh, normal town meetings, uh, unless it was like the water company, you know, when we sold our water company, we had 150 people there. 
And I think that our, actually we had 102 people there and the ball was uh, 102 to sell the water company. So we did a good job of selling that. Um, uh, we did get a federal grant for our housing trust uh, for $700,000 uh, for the construction of, uh, of uh, our first really official uh, new project for workforce transition housing, uh, as we prefer to be called. Uh, we also had uh, organized and the Falls Village Housing Trust bought a rundown apartment building uh, in town and got uh, a very large grant to uh, rehab that and keep that uh, in affordable housing, but bring it up to a standard uh, that it was not for the purchase. Uh, We've done a couple of roads in town. We've gotten, uh, we uh, had new signage and everything. We worked with the state and I actually, they did a very, very good job of realigning 126 and seven in our town, forcing people to square off at the intersection. This has been a very dangerous intersection. We've had a hundred accidents, literally a hundred accidents there. And since their project, we have not had one. And uh, we also, a couple of years ago, got 63 and seven. We got to put a stop sign at 63. We have dramatically reduced the number of accidents we've had there too. Um, I agree with the mirror comments because this is something that will not go away. I think it's a great thing uh, to get involved in. And um, I'm looking forward to spending more time in advance. <laughs> that's my, uh, my, my end of my story. But thank you all for, it, this has been a wonderful group to work with. I think it's really cooperative, uh, thoughtful and, uh, Boy, especially especially in my first couple of years, uh, it was really helpful to me have somebody to call up and so uh, ask a question about. So that's it for me. We we had a, a handful drop off due to other meetings, unfortunately. I think we still have James back, and I think that's Gordon online. I don't want to go for Gene. Looks like she's first. Hi. Um. Yeah, just sort of ditto to what everybody else said. Um, we are new playground. The vendor has been amazing working with us. The playground, I believe, is completely done now. It was a hundred thousand dollar capital expenditure, and it is it's like night and day to what used to be there. <laughs> it was sort of like a splinter factory, what was there before in comparison. <laughs> Anybody with little kids should come down and check it out at Kent Commons Park. Um, we're working with Kent Affordable Housing, which is the nonprofit that pretty much is turnkey um, helping us implement our affordable housing plan. And they have uh, made a request to um, to acquire a small parcel that is connected to um the Kent Commons affordable housing and it would they would be able to expand another I believe it's 10 to 12 units that would be actually a little bit larger than the existing ones um, with garages underneath and so we're working through just some details in the 824 review process with planning and zoning um, but that looks like it's I mean it makes total sense it's a great um, location and we just have to work out the details and wetlands and all that sort of stuff. Um, bunch of different road projects. We're um, gonna be submitting an LOI for the NEVI grant process that's due in a couple of weeks. We're gonna be replacing the two at uh, Town Hall, adding two more there. Those will be passive income, they won't be free. And then we're gonna hopefully add a bank of four right next to the Welcome Center, which is right in the thick of things. It's, you know, 50 feet, not even off of Route 7. So that's gonna be um, a pretty exciting project. 
both of those should be relatively unremarkable to do. Um, hopefully, you know, not to jinx myself. Um, Streetscape 2 is moving along. We had a site walk with the neighbors, I think two weeks ago, um, which is always an adventure. We have, um, there's some residents on one of the streets who I think there's just a gap in understanding and they don't want a sidewalk on their, on their road, <laughs> which, um, we tried to help them understand that it's, we're way past that point and there's going to be a sidewalk and it's going to be amazing. Um, just trying to, you know, help educate them on, why a sidewalk is a really great thing. Um, so that's moving along. My guess is at this point, we're probably looking at fall construction of next year for that project. There's, you know, it's a, um, that's the, oh shoot, it just went out of my head. The money that the COG helped us get, the $2.35 million. <laughs> um, the, yeah, I can't remember what it's called. It's an acronym. Um, anyway, the there's a lot of DOT back and forth. And because we're on um, one of the legs of this is State Highway, which is 341. So DOT is um, heavily involved in that. So we're back and forth with them. But I think we have a good team in place having this sort of concierge consultant that the DOT required us to have um has been nothing but fantastic i mean they're holding our hand through everything it it's a totally different experience versus streetscape one when we had to sort of wander through figuring out a lot of the weedy details of um of all the deliverables of the the previous grants um looking at a, a lot more grants moving forward um i i think those are the heavy, heavy hitting items. And again, to dovetail on the other folks who are exiting without getting weepy, um, just a huge, huge um, debt of thanks and gratitude, not only to the COG team, you guys are always right there with my ridiculous questions and, <laughs> hey, is there a grant for this? Or can you, you know, help dig up some transportation question? <laughs> Casey that I'm I'm always um putting forth so really appreciate all that you guys have done and the big transition that you're all you've all been going through for the past couple of years and being able to continue to serve us all while you're trying to you know basically um you know create a new team and and build a new infrastructure for for us and I'm just very grateful for that and then now I'm gonna get weepy sorry <laughs> Um, just appreciate all of you all in the room. If there's anybody left on the call, I think it's just me. I think everybody went over to the steep meeting. Um, just being able to pick up the phone and call any of you or send anybody an email, sending all those emails out with the questions that we've been able to do over for me over the last four years and get, you know, 10 answers, 15 answers all in, you know, one felt swoop has been so valuable. Um, and also, you know, creating the friendships that I've created over the last four years, um, just lots and lots of gratitude from my seat here. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say, because I'm going to get like actually weepy. Gene, I can tell you, you always keep us on our toes over here with your questions, so they are very appreciated. <laughs> Thank you, Gene. Uh, who else do they have? Gordon, I think it's, it's not behind select class. There's Gordon. I don't think it cares. Gordon? Can't tell who exactly who it is. It just says select. But it's usually, I think, Gordon. But maybe he's not. Maybe he took, maybe he took, I don't even see that enough. But that's all we have in the plan. Okay. Oh, now he's gone. <laughs> he's scared. Okay. <laughs> All right, administrative items. Um, you want to handle these, Rob? Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, the minutes, uh, obviously, pretty self explanatory. Unless anybody has any comments, okay. minutes. Uh, we have a motion to approve the minutes. So, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, it's passed.
approval of the financial statement. Uh, All right, so in your packet, you'll see a, a new format uh, as requested. Uh, we, you know, we're trying to change the way we report out our current financial activity. Uh, this report itself is basically uh, from July 1 until mid-September, I believe, because the way our bank accounts, uh, our statements work, uh, it's basically mid-month. And to change that would be, I, I guess, uh, a little time-consuming and maybe uh, realistic. So it's basically reporting out until the middle of September. So uh, again, our bookkeeper, uh, accountant, uh, my office LLC, Cynthia Ryan, she's the one that's kind of behind this, uh, the driver changed the way this looks. Uh, but it basically just encompasses, and again, I'm not an accountant, um, so if you have questions on this uh, or any any comments, concerns, anything I could take back, uh, feel free, either now or, or later, uh, if, you have, if you have a chance to take a look at it, um, and we'll just continue to refine it uh, as we move forward. One thing I'll note about the certificate of deposits, as each one of these mature, uh, the rates right now, uh, as you probably know, are a lot higher than if you've had them rolling over for a period of time. We think that there's an opportunity to let them mature and then uh, and then reinvest, basically, uh, to try and capture some of the higher rates. So when those mature, we're going to be uh, we're going to be looking at that. Uh, and uh, um, you know, the, the 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 big news on this is that uh, we did receive our regional service grant. We have it as accrual here. Uh, but we did receive it uh, in the last, I think, 10 days. That's the big uh, pie, piece of the pie, so to speak, that we have. We got it in one lump sum. They've been doing it the last two years from OPM, which is great because it provides all of our operating income over the course of the year, basically, to do what we do. So uh, it's very appreciative that we can get that early on in one lump sum. So um, with that, uh, any questions, comments, suggestions, we'll take it now. I think it's moving week. in the right direction. That's one of the comments. So I take it. Motion to approve. Thank you. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that's approved. Um, C? Yeah, so uh, this memorandum of understanding uh, is COG collaboration on the 2022 2023 Home and Security Grant. Uh, every year we have a new Demis grant that we go through um, the process, and every year this is on your agenda, uh, and it's basically just uh, updating the information to reflect the most current uh, Homeland Security grant. We need to do this because uh, traditionally what we've had is we've had in others, Region 5 Demis has uh, all of our towns and also has uh, towns from uh, West Cog and NV Cog. So uh, typically there's some work associated with uh, the uh, administration of that grant through the emergency support functions, uh, involvement from other COGS, and we have an agreement put in place so that we you know, are on the same page and it, it lays out what each COG can get paid for the, the work that they do. Uh, since I started here, I started to look at the amount of work that was coming out of the other COGS and how much we were paying the other COGS. And I started to question a little bit, you know, what, is it in balance? Uh, I had conversations with uh, the executive director of both COGS, Rick Dunn and, and Francis Pickering. And uh, essentially, what we, what we came to on this particular grant, as things are changing at Demis as well, uh, as, as, as our responsibilities, uh, we decided that NV COG really doesn't do enough to justify what, they were, uh, what their allocation was. And, they, and, and frankly, Rick had said that most of what if they do, their involvement, they can easily do under a different uh, funding structure is very minimal, uh, you know, a couple of ESFs. So the agreement between NVCOG and us is that uh, NVCOG doesn't really need to be part of that anymore. They continue to do the work they've been doing. They're just not going to be drawing from the grant, which will help us shift that uh, that those monies over to staff, which is we've been spending a lot more time on it than we get, than we get for grant funding. So it's a little more in balance. Westcock, a little bit of a different story. Um, at this point in time, there was still a lot of question about uh, what we should do uh, with Westcock, and, and we decided that we'll just stay the course with Westcock for this green round. So this MOU right now reflects an agreement between Westcock and NHCOG and not NVCOG. Uh, it breaks down the, the tasks and the money associated with that. And NVCOG's or uh, Westcog's amount is still going to remain twelve thousand for this grant, and we'll revisit again next year. So that's the that's the long story of that since we have the time right now. Um, but uh, just need an authorization. I have Westcog as well. 
Uh, I don't know if it has to go to the board or if Francis has the authority to sign it or not, uh, but either way, it's, it's in their ball. They're, they're so, do I have a motion to approve it? Second. Second. So it's status quo. Status quo with West Cog, and we're just not uh, doing a formal agreement with NBC. We're still working together as partners. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Uh, those abstaining, very nice, screwed. Okay, um, any other business to come before us? I'll just make one note. I, I wanted to mention it uh, in uh, my report, but uh, we have for our regional planner job posting we have out there, we have an interview scheduled for tomorrow, Tuesday of next week. Um, and so we're hoping to fill that position as well. And I've already started to kind of work a little bit on the uh, the final position that's part of the budget is with our increase in our RSG funding, which is going to be uh, really highly dependent, uh, really highly focused on GIS. So it's still be a regional planner type position, but GIS focus. The thought is that there's a you know we have a lot of growth opportunity there to try to fix the region and maybe even lower the cost that some of your towns may be paying for GIS services and uh, internally and externally. Uh, so it's something that I think is a whole growth area that you know every cog has GIS. Uh, we really kind of don't. We've contracted it out in the past um, as needed, but I think uh, this would be a real a benefit uh, for the region as well. And, and all of this combination. Uh, we're hoping to free up some time and we can start assisting more with grant, uh, you know, grant application assistance if you have that uh, to try to help out there as well. Too. So I'm actually really excited right now as far as uh, I'm starting to see a little bit more of the capacity building that, you know, is part of the kind of overall vision for the region. And I think uh, all that's made possible with the increases to RFG, the DOT funds, uh, and uh, of course, we've got Leah with the Ursa grant. Uh, yeah, so we have a lot of money that's coming in, and it's no additional dollars and your dues, your local dues. So I think we're about ready to kind of turn a corner and really start to increase our capacity, expand our services, and, and do things uh, a little bit more in depth. Uh, I think we should be doing because uh, we'll have more time. So, separate subject before we close, I didn't include it in my uh, updates. But I just called the state on seventy-five thousand dollars with the grant funds that I didn't make six months for. And then if this is down, two people felt the need to say it. I wasn't going to say it because I've run into this before. But if this is a trend, I think this is something we need to, you know, keep on. You know, that we're having hard times. Believe me, we're slow to pay the EVP or whatever. But the first one to tell you. Mm -hmm. But when you're waiting six months on planning grant for rails and trails or whatever it is, then fine. You know, I'm funding that out of capital. You is know? that coming out of DOT? Uh, well, they come out of all agencies. These speed grants get funded by different agencies, different organizations that receive them. Mine was PDP. Okay. Yeah, recreational trails. But why are we waiting six months? Yeah. It's well, a lot of turnover at the state level. And I, and I tell you, we, we've had a staff uh, have had some real growing pains with certain programs with, with DOT. Uh, trips, is still, we're still waiting on the trip, the trip program. Uh, you know, and we're not trying to point fingers, but they, they've gone through a whole uh, because of the grand, uh, great resignation, basically. <laughs> so, retirement, I should say. So, yes, I, it's we're feeling it too. Uh, I, I just would add one thing we actually finished a bridge that we finished six years ago. We actually finally got uh, four months ago, we got the uh, decision. So, I'm two years in advance, and that's uh, yeah. it. Only yeah. about six years. Six years. It's absolutely idiotic. You know, and it's funny because it just reminded me of what you said, Patrick, about you know, the flood damage that you're still trying to resolve. Those are local roads, right? Yeah. But I was in Vermont uh, a couple of times uh, since the flooding there, and uh, locals have been repaired, but also the state. Everything's been repaired. And I know some in some cases it's because they had to. It's an emergency. They got to get in and out. Because they're on an island, but still, the, the the progress that Vermont goes through on this these types of things is so much faster. That's why they're like the yeah. in the country. Yeah. Rob, is anything more on the trip program? Uh, Casey, you got any updates on that? And then we keep asking. <laughs> Yeah. No updates. Last update that you got. What was the last update? The October. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Oh. So lunch will be here in 10 minutes, so hang on. So I think if you could either either open